So my talk will be uh, on the action of the Virasaur algebra in quantum spin chains. And I want to start by thanking the organizer, Vincent Pasquier, for organizing this talk. And this talk will be based on work together with Uwe Soleil, Jesper Jacobsen, Lawrence Liu, and Yi Feihe. This talk will be divided in four different parts. So I will begin by introducing the Kusala generators which are a discretized version of the Virasora generators that we can use within the quantum spin chain. Then for the next part, I will focus on the XXZ spin chain and have we used Beth Ansatz techniques in the context of the Kusala generators. For the third part, I will be discussing the convergence of the Kusala generators. Are they converging to Virasora generators? And if so, in what sense? And finally, I will present some numerical results regarding the structure of the Virasor modules that appear in the continuum limit of the lattice models that we are interested in. And the main reference for this talk is this paper on archive. So, introducing the Kusala generators. So, the models we will be interested here in are um, lattice models at criticality and we will be looking at the corresponding continuum limit conformal field theories. So some typical examples would be the six vertex model here to the left, or the POTS model here shown as the three states POTS model, and some applications would be polymers and percolation. And within these models, we want to compute some endpoint functions that could be the probability that endpoints are in the same cluster. Let's say that two points are in this uh, green POTS cluster here. And in this context, the conformal field theories of interest are non-unitary with a central charge that is less than one. And I will be focusing in this talk on the case of C generic, which means non-rational, and on the six vertex model here to the left. And this one is what corresponds to the XXZ spin chain in its spin chain formulation. So more specifically, we are looking at models with twisted or twisted periodic boundary conditions which means that in the continuum we are looking at a bulk conformal field theory rather than a boundary conformal field theory. And we are looking at Hamiltonians on the form of simply a sum of temporary leap generators. So, um, okay, we're good now, very good. <laughs> and uh, we can also put diagrams and straighten out lines, and this is the second temporary leap uh, relation. And since we have periodic boundary conditions, we also need some relations to the translation operator. And this can also be seen very easily by just drawing diagrams. So with this Hamiltonian, we can specify an energy density, which is just the temporary leap generator. And here we have removed an extensive part just to set the ground state energy to zero in the continuum limit. Then based on this energy density, we can also construct a momentum density, which will be this commutator here. And taking these together, we can build components of a discretized version of a stress energy tensor, either T or T bar, depending on the sign. And then we all know that the modes of the stress energy tensor would be the virus or generators. So similarly, we take modes of this discrete version of the stress energy tensor. And this defines the so-called Kusala generators that were introduced in the early 90s. And originally they were introduced in a slightly different way where they cons considered some lattice word identities by stretching and straining a lattice and finding what should be the discrete version of a stress energy tensor based on this. So the parameters here, I will be using X to parameterize everything. So the central charge will be given as one minus six over x x plus one and it's related to the lattice parameters through the loop weight which we give as two cosine gamma with gamma being pi over x plus one and then to relate the fields in the cft to the fields in the lattice we say that the fields in the conformal field theory correspond to so-called scaling states which i will define more clearly later but they are essentially just low energy states where we have some energy cutoff that we are only allowed to raise after we have taken the system size n to infinity. So this is, will be a double limit procedure that we call the scaling limit. And an application to these Kusala generators 
would be to consider non-unitary conformal field theories and the structure of the virus or modules that appear. So if we consider observables related to loops, where the loops could be, for instance, the boundaries of these clusters in the POTS model, if we enlarge a bit, you could draw them like this. Then if you want to draw these diagrams and assign a weight per loop, this would be a very non-local problem. And we can turn it local by instead assigning a weight for each time this curve turns right or left and sum over the two directions. So then we would recover the loop weight uh, like this, to cosine 6v in this case, on a hexagonal lattice, but we have local Boltzmann weights that are complex. So this is now a non-unitary problem. And if we compare it to unitary conformal field theory, the representation theory is much more complicated. So in unitary conformal field theory, you could have irreducible representations of the Virasor algebra, or you could have the ones that are fully reducible, so it's simply a direct sum of irreducibles. If this is a non-unitary conformal field theory, then all bets are off. So we want to answer some questions. We want to use the Kusala generators to find, for instance, are there reducible but indecomposable modules? Are the null states in the theory actually zero? This is very important to know if we want to use deep Z differential equations. And are there logarithmic modules where the dilation operator L0 is not fully diagonalizable, but there would be some Jordan blocks? Okay, next, let's restrict our focus a bit to the spin chain and see what the base ansatz has to do with all of this. So to begin with, I want to discuss a bit the representations of the temporary leap algebra. So we have said that the Hamiltonian is the sum of temporary leap generators, but we haven't specified in what representation. And to pick different models, we pick different representations. So two representations that are of interest would be the loop representation, where we draw the states as half diagrams. And let's see if I can actually draw here. No, I can't, but we would act on these by stacking diagrams. <laughs> I hope you can see what I'm doing here. We would just stack a temporary leap diagram on top, for instance. A second representation would be the XXZ spin chain representation, where the states would be spin states, so just some combination of up and down arrows. And in this case, the temporary leap generator would be a particular combination of poly matrices that will fulfill the temporary leap relations. So it's given here by this combination here of sigma minus plus, plus minus, and z. And if we insert this into our Hamiltonian, we recover the usual XXZ spin chain Hamiltonian with an anisotropy here, delta, that is given by cosine gamma. So it is related to the loop weight. Next, I need to define the standard modules that will appear. So these are modules of the temporary leap algebra that are parameterized by j and phi, and also the size n. So how many sites do we have in the spin chain, for example? And these are denoted wj e to the i phi. So the interpretation of these parameters will depend a bit. If we are in the loop representation, then j would be the number of through lines of a state. So that would be, in this case, the lines that do not connect back up to another site. And phi would be the pseudo-momentum, which is the price you pay if you want to unwind through lines around the periodic boundary conditions. Meanwhile, in the spin chain, j would be the total magnetization of the chain, so just up arrows minus down arrows. And phi would be the twist of the boundary conditions. And we will focus on two types of modules here, either wj1, where j is not zero, and these will be irreducible for all sizes of the system or W0 with the twist related to the loop weight, gamma. Um, well, uh, the loop weight is given in terms of gamma, this twist is given in terms of gamma, and these are indecomposable. And they are indecomposable even in the case where we're looking at generic central charge. And for the latter one, both in the loop representation and the spin chain representation, the structure on the lattice of these modules will actually match the structure of the Virasor modules in the limit. So it's interesting to introduce these types of diagrams that will also appear later. So we will denote the type of indecomposable structure by drawing the submodules. 
So in this case, we would have a submodule that is isomorphic to W11. And then there would be a quotient module on top. And then this arrow tells you that you can reach the submodule for the rest, from the rest of the module, but you can't get out of it by definition. And this is for the twist of uh, minus two i gamma for the opposite twist. In the spin chain, we actually get the dual structure where the role of the submodule and the quotient module switch place. So this would be called the standard module. This would be called the co-standard module. And in the loop representation, we would only get the option to the left. So for the spin chain, in the limit, we can describe it by a free field description. And as all good things, this comes connected to many names. So we could say that the lattice model behaves as a Coulomb gas. We could say that we are making a dutsenko fateyev construction or a feigen fox construction. Either way, we are looking at some bosonic fields. And we can consider the stress tensor, either the usual one, which is just d phi square. This would correspond to a conformal field theory with central charge one. Or we could make a twist where we add a background charge. And this background charge alpha zero is here parameterized by X as everything else. And this would correspond to a conformal field theory with C less than one. And it's exactly this C equal to one minus six over X, X plus one that we discussed before. And it turns out that the latter one is the relevant one if we want to use the temporary leap generators as the energy density. However, we could also explore the first option and we could even interpolate between these. So this is something I will return to at the very end of the talk if there is time. But for now, let's only consider the second case. Since we are considering a free boson theory, we do not only care about the Virasor algebra, we also care about the Heisenberg algebra, which is generated by the modes of the free boson current, which is d phi. So the generators, we call them AN. They fulfill the usual Heisenberg relation, which is very simple. And in terms of these, the modes of the stress energy tensor, which is the Virasor generators, would be a sum such that you see that the indices will match to the left and to the right. And it's easy to check that these will then fulfill the Virasor relation with this central charge. And we can note that due to these terms to the right, L and dagger will actually not be L minus one, which is what you would expect in a unitary theory. So this will be a non-unitary theory. Next, we want to look at our Fox space. So this is given by starting with a field that is a vertex operator, e to the i alpha phi, with alpha being some charge. And these states will be highest weight states for both the Heisenberg algebra and the Virasor algebra. And then you act on them by modes of the Heisenberg algebra to generate the rest. And in terms of the Virasor algebra, the weight of such a state is given by h equal to alpha square minus two alpha alpha zero with alpha zero being this background charge. So if we consider this as a module over the Heisenberg algebra, then the Fox space will always be irreducible. But we can reinterpret it as a module over the Virasor algebra. And in this case, it has a name. It's a feigen fuchs module. And it is only irreducible if this weight, h, is not degenerate. So we want alpha such that h is not hrs with these cats labels r and s being integers. If it is degenerate, we will have one of the descendants being an all state and we will have some type of indecomposable module. So since h is quadratic in alpha, then for any weight, there are two charges that would give rise to this weight. And we call these charges conjugate to each other. We mark it alpha C with the relation being just two alpha zero minus alpha giving the conjugate charge. And to know the structure of the module, it's not enough to know the conformal weight. We really need to know which of these two charges gave rise to it. So in particular, the Feigen Fox modules will be dual for these two conjugate charges. So as a very simple example, let's consider the charge alpha equal to zero. So this will give the identity state, 
times e to the zero. And if you recall that L minus one acts as a derivative, then applying it to this identity state will give you zero. So that's this little arrow here. You can't go down from alpha equal to zero. Meanwhile, if you would do the same to the conjugate case, which is just two alpha zero, then it's perfectly fine to take the derivative of e to two alpha zero phi. And we can similarly find what would be the value if we instead start from the level one state in the Fox space and we try to raise it. And we find the opposite result that if alpha is zero, it's perfectly fine. While if alpha is two alpha zero, the result will be zero. So these are two dual modules and the same will happen for any degenerate uh, choice of the weight. But of course, with the arrows going down to a lower level, So, let's see what this has to do with the Bethian sets. So we want to somehow identify the states on the lattice with primary or descendant states. And to do this, we use the fact that the XX spin chain is integrable and we will characterize the states in terms of the Bethian sets. So to give some of the ingredients we will use, I remind you that in the Bethian sets, we use a monodromy matrix and it is written here in terms of the operators A, B, C and D. And it is such that its trace is the transfer matrix. We then define the beta states, which are some combination of plane waves with the momenta given by the beta roots lambda k. So we can think of these operators B as creation operators that act on a pseudo vacuum, which is a state with all spins up. And the number of operators B acting on it will decide how many of these arrows have been flicked down, which means it also decides the total magnetization of the chain. Similarly, we can create dual states by acting with the annihilation operator to the left on the pseudo vacuum in the dual form. And using the commutation relations between these four operators, we can find a relation that must hold in order for these basis states to actually be eigenstates of the transfer matrix. And I will not go into too much detail. We have some equation on this form called the Bethe equation that will decide what possible Bethe roots we can have. But the interesting thing will be to discuss these Bethe integers i that appear in this case. And just to relate back to the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian would be given by the logarithmic derivative of the transfer matrix. And if we diagonalize T, it means we diagonalize H. So why do we care so much about the Bayesian integers? Well, they are a very nice way to classify the states. So to relate the states on the lattice to the states in the continuum, we can note that the energy would just give the conformal dimension H plus H bar. The lattice momentum would correspond to H minus H bar. And in particular for the lattice momentum, it is directly given by a sum of the beta integers up to some part that has to do with the boundary conditions. So the sum of beta integers tells us what is the conformal spin. So for what follows, it will be convenient to represent any set of beta integers as filled circles. This would be just minus two, minus one, zero, one, two. And then we can shift and move this um, in a very nice and pictorial way. So finally, let's define what is actually a scaling state. And these will be defined in relation to the ground state. So the ground state, it is known that it's given by the symmetric and maximally packed configuration of beta integers. And the beta integers will be such that we have magnetization zero. So you have half as many as what is your system size. And then to define a scaling state, we are allowed to make changes on the edges of this configuration. So for example, one change would be to reduce the number of beta integers. And this would be a magnetic excitation since it changes the magnetization. Or we could shift all these beta integers. So here we would have minus one, zero, one, two, three instead. This would be an electric excitation. Or we could combine these and make electromagnetic excitations and we could of course shift them or reduce them more steps. So we're calling them electric and magnetic excitations because this direct uh, relates directly to the Coulomb gas picture. And from this, we, there is a conjecture in this paper here by Kuhn-Sele, the original paper, 
that in the next exit spin chain with twisted boundary conditions parameterized by phi, which we re-parameterize here by 2 pi e phi, then the type of states above will correspond in the scaling limit to primary states, V alpha alpha bar, where the charges alpha and alpha bar have the cuts labels given in terms of E minus E phi and SZ. Or we can write them more explicitly in terms of the screening charges alpha plus and alpha minus that appear in the theory. These are also parameterized in terms of X and will have some relation with the background charge alpha zero. So that's one type of scaling states, which is the primaries. We also need to find descendant states. And this is where the picture of knowing that some of the beta integers give h minus h bar is particularly useful. Because we know that if we have a primary state of a certain weight, and if we lower it, then we change this conformal weight, which means we shift the spin. And we shift it by a precise number of steps, which means we need to shift the beta integers by the same number of steps. So if we want to make an excitation such that we reach chiral level one, then we just jump here one step, or anti chiral, we jump on the other side, or to reach both levels, or if we want to reach, for instance, level two, then these type of states where we either jump with two integers or we jump one integer two steps would form a basis for level two. Okay, so we have a conjecture for the charges. How do we check it? How do we know that this is actually the states that we have? Now we want to use the Kusala generators to see if the action of the virus or algebra on these states is actually what we would expect. Which means that we want in particular to reach very large sizes. Um, and to do this, it's not very convenient to use exact diagonalization. You can't reach very large size. So we will again need the beta ansatz. So to take an example of what type of check we want to make, let's return to this case of conformal weight zero, which we have two charges that we'll give raise to. So we find the two eigenstates of the Hamiltonian for a given system size that would correspond to these two primary states. And we find the two eigenstates that would correspond to the two level one uh, descendant states. And then we act with the Kusala generator at that size. So we act with the lowering generator and we project on this level one state or we act on the level one state and we project up to the primary state. And we do this for larger and larger values of the size n, which is why we really need the Bethian sets, and then we extrapolate. So what we are looking at here is matrix elements on the type of some eigenstate some combination of poly matrices and then projecting back up some other eigenstate. And these are called form factors and there is a known way to find these analytically. So this is called the quantum inverse scattering method and I will present it briefly. So the recipe to find this matrix element is to look inside the monodromy matrix at these four operators. And we have already seen that the beta states will be given in terms of B and C. But it also turns out that the local operators, the poly matrices, can be given in terms of these four operators. So for instance, sigma z would be given by the difference of a and d for a particular value of the spectral param parameter, and the identity would be given by a sum, and so on. So the problem reduces to finding these matrix elements where we have a few operators a, b, c, d in the middle, and then two basis states uh, on the left and right. And this we do simply by using the commutation relations between the four operators. And there are some known expressions for scalar products of best states. So what we get from this is analytical expressions for the matrix elements that we can evaluate and get numerical results at very large size. But interestingly enough, we get some exact results as well when it comes to the duality of the modules that holds for any lattice size. So the beta states that correspond to these conjugate charges are in fact related by just changing the sign of all the beta roots. And there will also be relations between the whole form factors uh, if we consider parity and conjugation on the lattice. So what we find is in terms of diagrams that the matrix elements that would correspond to these crossed out arrows here are identical at any size. 
or at least any size that are large enough to accommodate the states. And similarly, the matrix elements that would correspond to the not crossed out arrows here are identical on the lattice. So this is a very neat result. Okay. So before I present what numerical results we actually find by using this, uh, we need to discuss a bit if the Kusala generators are actually converging to Virasora generators. And if not, what do we need to do? So this is part three of the talk. Uh, if there are any short questions up until this point, then go ahead. I see there is something in the chat. Uh, right. Yeah, I can send the PDF. Okay. No short questions. So, third part. Do we have convergence of the Kusala generators to the Virasura generators at infinite system size? And since we are considering matrix elements, we are only discussing weak convergence here. And the issue that we need to think a bit more about is what happens if we have products or commutators? So we have said that we only want to consider low energy states, but if we have a product such as this one, L minus two followed by L two, this one is of interest because it will measure the central charge. Then we can split up the identity in the middle and this sum here will involve all the states, even the very excited ones. So we have checked very carefully numerically that on their own, the matrix elements of a single uh, Kusala generator do converge. So if we have some contributions that we do not want, that should be zero, then they will indeed converge to zero. However, the number of states will grow very rapidly as the size increases. So even if all these contributions that are unwanted would go to zero on their own, then just the number of them would make up for that and we would get a finite contribution. So we would not get convergence of this total matrix element. So to deal with this, what we need to do is to introduce a cutoff also in the intermediate stage. And only after we take the system size to infinity are we allowed to lift this cutoff. So let's see what this looks like numerically. Let's say that we want to plot the specific matrix element that measures the central charge, or rather the central charge divided by two. And I have on the right divided through by the expected values that we can see in more detail what happens. So if we have no cutoff and we take larger and larger size and we extrapolate, we do not find the correct value. In fact, we find it for almost no value of X apart from three specific values. So it's a bit hard to see here, but at X equal to three and X equal to one, this curve will overlap. And also at X equal to two, which we do not see here because we have divided by the central charge, which in that case is zero. So there are three values where it happens to work out, but in general, it does not. Meanwhile, if we introduce a cutoff, we do the same thing. We take larger and larger size, we extrapolate, then this would be the small dots here and we match the conjecture perfectly. So with these types of checks, we find that we do have what we call scaling weak convergence that involves its cutoff in any products. However, we also wanted to see how wrong is the result if we do not have this cutoff and what exactly goes wrong. So what we did here was to check the limit of a commutator versus the commutator of limits. So the commutator of limits of single Virasoro generators should follow the Virasoro relations. Sorry, the commutator of limits of Kusala generators, since we know that on their own, uh, they do converge. So if you recall the shape of the Kusala generator, then they are given by modes of this discrete stress tensor, which involves the energy density and the momentum density. So it will be convenient to consider combinations such that we isolate the energy density and the momentum density. So we take Ln plus or minus L bar to minus N. And we define that we call the Hamiltonian density H1, the energy density, H2, the momentum density. And it turns out that you can keep defining higher Hamiltonians that will give either this combination of the sum, if M is odd, or the difference if m is even. 
And these higher Hamiltonians will be found if you take further derivatives of the logarithm of the transfer matrix. And they will be increasingly complicated. So H3 is still fairly okay. It involves the identity commutator of temporary leap generators and the nestled commutator. But the higher they go, the longer these expressions will be. And now what we want to do is to compare the relation uh, where we take this specific sum, for example, or we could take the difference and we check what we would expect. So in this case, we would compare H1 and H1 to H2. If you recall, H1 would give the sum, H2 would give the difference, or we could compare H1 and H2 to H3. That would also give the correct limits or H2 and H2 to H4. This would also mean that the limit works out. And if we do all these three steps, then we could isolate the commutator of two Kusler generators and see if it is indeed correct. So let's do this. And it doesn't quite work. So for the first step, it's very straightforward. We just expand these exponentials in terms of one over n, and we compare the left and the right side, and we see that two leading order in one over n, these expressions are the same. That's fine. For the other two steps, it will be a bit more involved, and in particular, the second step will fail. And I will talk more about how it fails, but you can note already that this is the only case where the central charge is actually involved. And it turns out that this is where it fails. So what do we do for these other ones? Well, for n non-zero, which is where the central charge again is not relevant, then these expressions do match up to a reminder. And this reminder is a combination of temporary leap generators. It is independent of which modes we are looking at. So what is P and what is N? And we simply check it numerically by plotting its matrix elements between various scaling states. And we check that it decreases with N fast enough to also be subleading. However, at n equal to zero, these expressions will only match if C would have a specific value C star that is given in terms of these integrals I0 and I1. And these integrals come from looking at the values of these higher Hamiltonians in terms of the thermodynamic Bethian sets. So these are known. And it would seem that in general, C should not match this value. We know that C has a fairly simple expression. And indeed, it only matches for these specific values, x equal to 1, 2, and 3. In general, if we are not at these values, we will get a modified relation where the central charge is slightly off in the cubic term. And we can check that this prediction is actually correct by simply plotting the commutator with and without a cutoff. So without a cutoff, this again will match what should be the central charge. And without a cutoff, we find that it matches exactly this modified conjecture, but up to numerical accuracy. So having figured out exactly how the Gusler generators converge and seen that we really need this cutoff, we can now use them to find the structure of the modules that appear in the limit of the exit that's been chain. So this is the last part of the talk. So you can recall these types of diagrams that we have seen many times. We have some given uh, weight and we have two possible conjugate charges that would give it. And we want to find which ones of these appears in the spin chain. And it turns out that they always appear in a pair. So for any magnetization, we would find both. For instance, in this case, we can plot here uh, what happens if we look at the down arrow. So the matrix elements corresponding to the left diagram will decrease to zero, as would be expected. The one to the right, it goes to a specific non-zero value that we know what it should be. And the same holds if we consider some other degenerate weight, such that one that has the null states as level two or level three. Uh, we can't go too far because it gets increasingly complicated on the lattice, but we are quite confident that the pattern will remain. And thanks to the duality that we found before, we might in fact explore only 
the down arrows, because if we look at the matrix elements corresponding to this one, then we're getting this up arrow for free. And if we look at the one corresponding to this down arrow here, we get the matrix element corresponding to this one for free. So we hold the number of matrix elements we need to look at. And in practical terms, we are easily reaching sizes up to n equal to 80. If we use a laptop and we let the code run for a few hours or overnight, depending on which matrix element we are looking at. And the agreement with the conjecture is typically three or four decimals at this size. So let's be a bit more specific. Um, since so far I've been focusing on the chiral side for a lot of slides, and of course we have both since it's a bulk CFT. So let's define the notation. We have in decomposable modules, we have the usual Verma module in which there is a submodule generated by the null state. And if we take the quotient, we give an irreducible module that we call the cats module. Or we can have the dual option, which we will call coverma. And for any non-zero magnetization, we find that the states uh, will go to a combination where we have the verma modules on the antichiral side and the coverma modules on the chiral side. And this is for j larger than zero and s that equal to j. If you switch the magnetization, what happens is simply that the chiral and antichiral sides switch role. Next, if you look at zero magnetization, then at uh, the twist to I gamma, we would get coverma on both sides. So to see the dual case, we need to switch the twist. And then we get verma on both sides. Now, I've been talking about the XXZ spin chain a lot, but we can do the same type of work in the loop model by constructing the Kusala generators. So we have the same Hamiltonian, uh, but instead of picking the XXZ spin chain representation for the temporary leap generators, we pick the loop representation, which we can easily represent numerically as well. And we will have the same eigenvalues, so we expect the same conformal weights. If you recall, the some of the conformal weight is given just by the energy and the difference is given just by the lattice momentum which is also the same in the two different representations. What changes is that there is no interpretation in terms of these charges alpha and alpha bar. So we are not looking at the bosonized spin chain anymore. So we do not expect Feigenfuchs modules. And in particular in the loop model if we look at these standard modules with j equal to zero we only have standard modules. And furthermore, it is natural to restrict the quotient module, which we call W bar. So we have quotiented out the submodule that is isomorphic to W11. And that carries over into the continuum limit where we only see the quotient module, which is the cuts module. Meanwhile, if we look at WJ1, where J is non-zero, and if we look at conjugate states, we find that their null descendants coincide. So we could imagine that we have this type of diagram where we simply have two arrows going down to the same state. However, we know that the template leap modules are irreducible at all sizes, which in particular means that they are self-dual. And we would expect this self-duality to carry over to the infinite size, which means that we need to add this little node here so that if we reverse all the arrows, the diagram still has the same general shape. And these results can be found in another paper here. And uh, I will send the slides so you have all the references. Okay, I want to briefly discuss what happens also when C is rational. So in this case, uh, the reason that we have avoided it so far is that all the modules are much more complicated both on the Virasor side and on the temporary leap side on the lattice. So for instance, for the Virasor modules, Feigenfuchs modules might look like these options here where you have, okay, this one is nice, it's just an irreducible, direct sum of irreducibles. Here you start having these long chains or these braids. And we can still use the same method. We can use the Kusala generators to act on, for instance, the identity 
and see if we can reach the level one state, uh, which we cannot, so there's no down arrow here. Or we can act on 2i alpha zero and times the boson, the boson, and then in this case we can reach the level one state, so this carries over. Um, so we can sort of walk around in the module and map up the shape. And we find that indeed we still match the Feigenfox modules. And it turns out that the temporary leave modules in the spin chain at uh, rational values of C also will have a Feigenfox type of structure. So we have invited um, a student of Ivan Santamal. The student is called uh, Theo Pine uh, to give a talk about this because this is some recent work that they have been doing. And last I heard, they will, this talk will happen in mid-February. This is something that Vincent can probably confirm. But for anyone who's interested in these things, I would recommend to also go to this talk. And we plan to use these results in our future work. So we are very happy that they have been working on this. Okay, um, so to summarize what we have been saying so far, we have defined the Sucosalar generators, which are written in terms of temporary leap generators, and which are a discrete version of the Virasora generators. We have said that the one application of these is to look at the structure of Virasora representations, which is particularly interesting in non-unitary conformal field theory, where the Virasora representations can be very complicated. Uh, ah, 15th of February. Okay, we have a date, 15th of February for Theo's talk. Very good. So in the XXZ spin chain, we have seen that the beta ansatz will give conjectures for the charges alpha, and it will give some exact results for lattice duality when we look at the form factors and relations in the conjugation and parity. And we have seen that it allows us to reach large, sy large system size. We have discussed convergence, and we have seen that we need scaling weak convergence. That's all we get. So we must have a cutoff inside any products of Kusalar generators. And if we do not, the central term comes out wrong. It is quite interesting, I would say, that only the central term comes out wrong. It's much better than one could expect a priori. Um, and finally, we have seen the numerical results. So we see that in the spin chain, we find both these types of modules that we have been discussing, both Verma and Coverma. And of course, if we look at some primary state that has a non-degenerate central chart, sorry, non-degenerate conformal weight, then we just find the usual irreducible uh, modules. So here we have focused on the cases where we have something more interesting. And since there is some time left, I also want to discuss briefly how we could, um, sorry, do I, yes, I can reach the next slides. Um, I want to discuss briefly what happens if we want to consider instead a C equal to one CFT. So this is what we will call the ordinary XXZ spin chain. So you might recall this expression of temporary leap generators in terms of polymatrices and that we built the Hamiltonian by taking a sum of these. Now, if you looked more carefully at this expression, then there is one term here sigma z j minus sigma z uh, j plus one that will telescope away in the Hamiltonian. So this term does not matter. So instead we could just take away this term and use the rest as the energy density. So this would be the same expression apart from this sine gamma term. And we construct the momentum density using this energy density instead. And we use these to build the Kusala generators. And this would correspond to having the usual untwisted stress energy tensor, which is just defy square. We would have the conformal weights being simply alpha square and the conformal central charge uh, being one. And in this case, uh, we expect a fully reducible structure and we can check everything numerically again. And this is what we find. And finally, if we want, we could, instead of setting this term to zero, we can multiply it by any number we want, since again, it doesn't appear in Hamiltonian. So we can interpolate by saying that we have some energy density mj, that is this energy density fj that we just defined if we set t to zero, or the 
case that we have been discussing the most, the temporary leave generator, if t is equal to 1. And we can check, for instance, the central charge. We can predict what it should be. And we can do the same type of measurements. And we see that with a cutoff, we exactly follow this prediction. Without a cutoff, we do not. And I should mention that this interpolation is probably not related to any kind of physical theory, because uh, in the cases where we have C less than one, we have this background charge alpha zero, and we have the charges given in terms of some screening charges that have to be related to this background charge. And if we do this kind of interpolation, we would break this relation. So it's not clear that we could have anything sensible when it comes to correlation functions. But as just a mathematical thing, it's rather cute. And yeah, with that, I will conclude the talk and open for questions. So anyone can ask questions. Please, please do ask your, your questions. Okay. Um, what about a formal field theory with central charge C star? Um, yes. Uh, we, so that's a good question. So we could um, simply redefine. Uh, let Let me go back to the um, uh, to this relation here. So if we wanted, we could redefine L0 so that instead of C and C star, we would have C star everywhere. And this would be fine. But we still have the issue that we do not have the convergence of the Kusala generators um, in that case either. So, so the main problem here is that we want to relate what happens on the lattice to what happens in the continuum limit. I should also note that as it stands, this relation here actually still fulfills the Jacobi relations. So from that point of view, it's it's fine as a relation. Um, we haven't found any meaning for this C, C star, uh, I should say. Um, properties of the function C star. Um, so it does simplify in the limit um, where c goes to 1. Uh, so in this case, these integrals would reduce to some polylogarithms. And this is actually, in one way, the most interesting case, because if you consider this, uh, sorry, this picture here, then the limit where c goes to 1 is actually where the issue is the largest. So in general, the larger the anomaly, the larger problem we have when we do not use cutoffs. So yes, in, in this specific case, it's just polylogarithms. But um, in general, I, I don't know anything further about what to say with, this, um, with these functions. Um, I haven't seen any neat simplification. Okay, we have some typing in the chat. I don't see any... I, I, yeah, I see you about typing in the chat. Um, <laughs> but other than that, um, you can also turn on the microphone. If that's well, maybe faster. Please. <laughs> okay, um, right. Uh, any idea what happens if the theory acquires a gap? The Kusala generators could still be studied. Um, so this would be, I guess, if we go outside of the critical regime, so we don't restrict to having a loop weight of less than two, I suppose. Um, I haven't looked at it, but we could certainly make the same type of construction. Uh, it's a good question. It's something we could look at. Um, but yeah, a priori I have no idea. I would expect that it would smoothly diverge from from whatever we have with the usual Virasor algebra, because so far, whenever we make a change, things change sort of smoothly. So I guess that the form of the Virasor algebra would be a reasonable guess. Yeah. 
There is a second question by you there. Okay. Uh, well, I think these two are the same questions. No, I, I see the one about a gap, and I think the second is just a guess that we would get some deformed Virasaur algebra, um, which I could also imagine. Um, in particular, I'm thinking if we take the loop weight just slightly higher than two. Um, what to use for correlation functions? Uh, do you mean how we use this for correlation functions or why we want correlation functions? <laughs> uh, if you mean how we use this for correlation functions, then one particular thing of interest would be um, that, sorry, if, if you look at these types of diagrams here, then if we are in the first case where L minus one will just give zero, then this is what we would usually expect. So we usually expect that for any correlation function that would involve identity, then taking the derivative would give zero. And more generally, for any correlation function that involves a degenerate state, you expect to have some differential equations that follow from the fact that if you try to lower, you should find zero. So it's very important to know if we can do that, because if we are in this right case with the exact same conformal weight, then we do not get this differential equation for the correlation functions. Um, it's also interesting um, if you look at, for example, the loop case, if we have this type of uh, logarithmic modules, then we would have correlation functions that involve some logarithms. So we would have states with logarithmic part partners. So in this sense, uh, the structure of the virus origin um, uh, modules give us some very valuable information for what we what we expect with the correlation functions. Now, if the question is applications of correlation functions, then well, we could consider, for for example, percolation and see what is the probability to have uh, a certain number of points in the same cluster. Um, so this, uh, for example, transport problems. Um, I admit I haven't looked that much at the applications. <laughs> well, maybe I can ask my question directly. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. If um, if now you wanted to compute uh, uh, fusion products of these modules, um, would you expect first that you can easily compute them on the lattice? And then, would you expect that by taking a large end limit, you could recover the fusion in the conformal field theory? Um, that is a good question that I have not been considering at all. So you want to somehow look at what happens if we try to fuse, for example, two different primary states that would correspond to two modules? Is that the question, roughly speaking? Yes. Uh, I think this is something that has been considered in the open case with open boundary conditions and boundary CFT. I do not, I haven't thought about it in the bulk case and I wasn't the one working on it in the boundary case. So I, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for you there. But it looks like Uber might. Okay. Another um, well, Uber is typing. I'm hoping he's giving the answer I couldn't provide. Uber, you can talk also. You can hear your voice. Uh, ah, microphone doesn't work. Um, okay. So the question is how how would you define fusion in this case? Question for Sylvain. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I would define it algebraically. I would rather define it as uh, what is needed to compute correlation functions. I mean, to decompose, say, a four-point function into three-point functions. Well, um, I'm not sure if Uber has a reply for this. Uh, to me, I do not have a reply to what that would even correspond to on the lattice. 
unfortunately. I, I would say that the most direct comparison would just be to look at a certain um, correlation function as uh, Jasper has been doing and to see which sectors on the lattice appear in this one. Um, so this is exactly what he's doing with his transfer matrix methods, but other than that, I do not know. Uh, Jesper, do you have any comments on this? Yes. Jesper is typing. Uh, yeah, okay, we need to figure out how to do fusion on the lattice, but yeah, indeed. Any, any more, any questions? Um, the, if I was typing, I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment. Uh, I would, by the way, like to suggest that if we upload this video somewhere, we should include the chat. Otherwise, it would be very hard for anyone who wants to listen in the future. Maybe ju just to help, when you when you switch on this thing, you should switch the microphone on at, at the beginning and then switch it off because otherwise you have trouble uh, talking. So I guess many people can't talk because of that. So, right. So oh, right. Yeah, I remember this issue from the PhD day. That's probably what has happened. <laughs> okay. Um, for those loop gas with an... Um, larger than minus two, the central, sorry, uh, if I'm reading this correctly, the central charge tends to minus infinity. What about the charge C star? Okay, so let's go back, right, thank you. Um, so let's go back to this um, pictures I was showing. Uh, where do we have them? Um, so here, for instance, you're meaning the, the limit to the left here when we decrease um, the value of X in this case. Um, well, in general, I would not expect it to match uh, C ever again, but we haven't actually studied this limit to the left. Um, it was somewhat difficult uh, with, with the way we had set up the code. So we haven't actually looked too far to the left here. Uh, we haven't looked further than x equal to 1. So, if, if you want to check, uh, you could simply compute these um, integrals, I suppose, and compare, but it's not something I have looked at. Um, can I ask a question, just like this? Uh, yeah, go. Ah, okay, I don't know why people... Uh, okay, most people were writing in chat, but anyway. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, so thanks for the nice presentation. I was uh, wondering, uh, so with Virasoro, pe uh, people often study conformal blocks that have lots of uh, nice uh, properties and are very much studied for rational models also. So do they play any role in your discussion? Would you see any way to link them with lattice models and so on? Um, so again, this knowing the structure of the Virasoro representations could possibly tell you something about the conformal blocks. So for instance, in the case where we have um, the loop representation and you know that you have a logarithmic uh, module, you might want to look at logarithmic conformal blocks. So in this way, it would give you some hints of what to expect, but we're not computing anything corresponding to, to conformal blocks directly on the lattice. And I, I, that it's the same question as with the fusion. I'm not even sure what it would exactly correspond to on the lattice. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, Jesper has pointed out a reference to archive for an attempt that did not quite work. Uh, Jesper, did, did you mean when it comes to conformal blocks or Ivan's question or which question are you referring to? <laughs> no, it's an attempt to do fusion. Uh, ah, the right. title is a fusion for the periodic temporal level algebra and its continuum limit. Okay, okay. Very good. So we're back to this question. Okay. Well, that's certainly relevant as a reference. Any further questions or comments? Well, then, if there is no further question, uh, I don't know how we can thank you for this very nice <laughs> talk in here. We, uh, we appreciated it a lot, and uh, thank you very much. Then. Okay, thank you. It was an honor to give it. So, 